Time change. Hello, Phil. Are you all sure. awake? Oh, I am wide awake, Johnny, because this is season two of Time Trippers, the podcast where we travel back in time year by year, event by event, and how we have to bring back an item each time. We've already been through the first decade of the 20th century, and now, 1911, we launch merrily into the second decade. Oh, I, I should also mention, um, and you'll know if you're watching this on YouTube, that this is now a multimedia video podcast, so you can join us in the time machine. Um, and uh, what have we got in store this, this week, this year? Well, it's 1911, and it's going to be a chilly one. Because we're off to the Antarctic. Mm, I thought the Antarctic was hot and the Arctic was cold. <laughs> I didn't really. Both, both cold. Uh, I think even Antarctic might be colder than the Arctic. Don't know if that's true or not, but mm. that's that's what I'm led to believe. But in 19, by, uh, <laughs> by various sources, <laughs> penguins told. Me. Oh, Amundsen, our sort of prota- one of our main protagonists this week. It was trying to be the first to the North Pole, and then someone else got there first. So Correct, yes, correct. He wanted to be the first man to explore the North Pole, but if he couldn't do that, he thought, well, what's second best? The South Pole. Exactly, and I believe he very quickly went down there. The problem being, of course, that the British rather see Antarctica as theirs to conquer. They've already made inroads in there, including our other protagonist, Captain... Robert Falcon Scott. Indeed, indeed, uh, Britain has long considered itself one of the pioneers of exploration, particularly Arctic and polar exploration. Uh, Scott had already been romping around the Antarctic a few years before on a trip with another very famous explorer, Shackleton. Mm. There's a bit of a catch this week. It's a new season, of course, Johnny. Usually we just get straight in the time machine, um, but we have to solve the puzzle. Our YouTube viewers will see that our beautiful robot 2.0 is holding a random number generator. Um, have a spin. All right. Number nine. Number nine. So you've got to, to um, capture our topic in nine words. No more, no less, or we're not going anywhere. That's... Well, this is actually a lot harder than it seems. <laughs> OK, let me have a go. British Scott versus Norwegian Amundsen in Race to Pole. Lovely. That was very good. Time shippers. Travel back in time to the twentieth century. You must do a podcast. Did you do any maintenance on the time machine in the last few weeks that we've been not travelling? Or are we just gonna see if we get where we want to? Well yes, I've done much maintenance as you can see, though there's always a few little perfections. Um, viewers will see that we are in our time machine, flying through time and space. The time angel who sends us on these quests. Shall we see what she has to say about matters? Sure, we got something to say, hasn't she? <laughs> Antarctic expedition. The Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and his team defy extreme cold, treacherous terrain and logistical challenges to successfully navigate the icy continent and reach the South Pole. They narrowly beat their British rivals, led by Robert Scott, whose expedition meets a tragic end. Why are we in London then, may I ask? We're in London because this is where the adventure begins for our Captain Scott. Um, At the behest of the the Royal Geographical Society, which is this here. Have you seen Paddington? I have, yes. Big fan of Paddington. Same, great sequence in the Royal Geographic Society as well. Um, But they basically uh, sort of sent Scott off on, on a mission. For scientific reasons. How do they choose their missions on which to send people? Do they just 
spin one of these big globes and yeah. randomly hit the <laughs> finger onto it. Pro- pro- oh, we're going to <laughs> Myanmar. Probably. I mean, called it Burma back then. They are big globes. Um, but yeah, Scott, is, uh, Scott then has to get his crew together. I don't really know why we're in London, to be honest, Johnny. Um, well, I mean, every adventure has to start somewhere, and it's nice to know that there's sort of like a, an organisation sending out adventurers to various places. It was the same with, with Amundsen. I, I've done a lot more research on Amundsen than I have on Scott. That works for me. So he too was, was sent out by a sort of a combination of adventuring society and also backers. Uh, as we mentioned, Amundsen had really wanted to get to the North Pole, but he'd found this had already been taken, uh, so he wouldn't have any glory in the trip that he'd planned for and that had been financed. Uh, so he rather sneakily changed his plans last minute without telling anyone until it was too late and said, yeah, we're not doing North Pole anymore, going to South Pole. And he was just such a ninja about it, because the, the British party by this point are, like, they're shouting loud about everything. Like, it's, it's a big thing. There's, there's quite a lot of hysteria and media um, pressure for them to be first to reach the pole. The um, newspaper archive... Mm, no, we're doing that, aren't we? If I, shut up, not you. Um, oh. Oh. But, but what I, well, the reason I made it... You know, you've already described Amundsen. Is that Amundsen up on our time machine screen? Yeah, yeah, that's Amundsen. The, he, he's a... Yeah, ben, well, well, third up there. Benefit of the listener, um, we've got our... Roald Amundsen, the Norwegian competitor, if you like, dressed, looking almost like a sort of teddy bear. And why is that, Johnny? Well, he's lived with Inuit before and sort of taken from their methods of keeping warm in the Arctic, which was to dress in fur, reindeer fur, or sometimes polar bear fur. I believe reindeer fur was preferred, though. Uh, just because it keeps you warm, it's it's a bit breathable. Well, and yeah, you may as well go native. Oh well, Johnny, as a, as the representative of the British Party, I can say that um, Imperial Britain is slightly uncomfortable about the idea of the English going native, and that includes wearing furs, which is seen very much as um, something that savages do. So we're going woolen, lovely wool. For our trip, hopefully we will. Okay, we'll. Well, we'll see how how they get on with that, won't we? Yeah, Scott got his crew together, a bit like Monkey Island, I imagine. Um, they all had to put in a a, a nice one k, um, a sweet one foul to to get on the trip, I believe. Um, okay. Wow. Well, so yeah, you, no uh, no pleasure cruise then. Absolutely. We're going. Um, so immediately, though, as you say, Amundsen's expedition immediately has focus. He's got one goal to get to the pole. The British one, by the time they leave, is already so confused with what the point of it is. It's an adventure, it's exploring, it's a scientific expedition, but then the pole fever's pressuring on them, so they're going to have a go at attacking the pole as well. So immediately, their focus is rather split, I would say. Mm hmm. And yeah, it, it's interesting when you say Anson uh, is a little bit perhaps sneakier than Scott because he's already got some foreknowledge of Scott's expedition and he's already been picked to the North Pole by Peary or Cook uh, and he's not going to let this happen again. Uh, and he's actually acknowledged that uh, for the British, their expedition was designed entirely for scientific research. Uh, to them, the pole was really like a side issue. Yeah. Whereas it was always the main object for Amundsen. He wanted to be the first man in the South Pole. And uh, I've got a nice little Amundsen quote to throw in on, on the back of that um, regarding the... Um... Split it out, then. Yeah, so... Exactly. Um, the English have loudly and openly told the world that skis and dogs are unusable in these regions, and that fur clothes are rubbish. We shall see. 
We shall see, he says. Let, let's not, uh, like, do down Scott's ambition, though, because he very much wanted to be the first man to reach the South Pole. In fact, he says to reach the South Pole and to secure for the British Empire the honour of this achievement. That is his, that is his uh, motivating goal, I think. Maybe others in the expedition are focused on the science and, uh, like, the, the sort of novelty of being the first people to research in this environment. Um, but, yeah, I think for Scott, he is the explorer at heart. He, um, yeah, it's very easy, and I've done a lot of it, it's very easy to bash Scott in, retro, in retrospect. Um, but, of course, the thing to um, bear in mind is that no one had ever done it before, or really got that far, so that's... Anyway, we'll come back to this later. The, uh, <laughs> the you know, the what did they do, right or wrong. But I think in, in hindsight, you can immediately see that Amundsen's got a focus and has thought really clearly about it, whereas this is all going to get a bit out of control. I mean, it's not. I don't know why I said that. Um, what do you think the newspapers are saying about all of this? Good question. I imagine uh, if they want to sell copy... They are trying to present it as a race, but then, yeah, they don't know that Amundsen is heading there yet. No, nope. like Scott's going there. Um, Amundsen's so been lying to the it. press uh, up to this point. Um, <laughs> Very sneaky. Um, I'm sure that they see Scott as yeah bringing this back for England, sticking that old flag in the pole and giving it a good wiggling. Well, no spoilers, Johnny, because um, people might not know how this ends. But it does involve 20 killer whales eating po- eating everyone's ponies on the Scott trip. Uh, that was a spoiler, really. Anyway, uh, well, here's our new feature. Yesterday's fish and trip paper. Welcome to uh, uh, the, uh, yeah, tomorrow's fish and trip paper. Um, so, I've got a few little. Uh, well, wasn't it yesterday's? No, I got it wrong then. And I said yesterday's fish and chip paper out of trip paper as the thing came up saying tomorrow's fish and trip paper. It's a catchy title. Um, so, 4th of October 1910. Captain Amundsen's plans. Captain Amundsen's plans. No suggestion of an Antarctic attack. He's quoted here as saying, My expedition is not primarily geographical, nor is it my chief ambition to reach the North Pole. Which is true, right? Yes, he's actually, in his personal letter, he does confess to a little bit of guilt about this. He says, I have often wished that Scott had been aware of this decision of mine, so that it did not appear that I would sneak down there without his knowledge to get ahead of him, but I have not dared to make any publication for fear of being stopped. And when he eventually does uh, let the cat out of the bag... He sends a very terse telegram to Scott saying, Captain Robert F. Scott, beg leave to inform you Fram, Fram's his ship, proceeding to Antarctica, Amundsen. And at that point, uh, they both are locked into this race. They both know that uh, the other is going to try to beat them. Uh, But yeah, only one man played the glory. By 1911, they're both in position. Their respective ships have made it to Antarctica. And this map shows that their base camps are well apart. Um, One on Ross Island, one on the Bay of Wales. Scott on uh, Ross Island, more to the east, and Amundsen to the west on the Bay of Wales. Uh, It's worth uh, mentioning that this shaves a lot of KM off of uh, Amundsen's uh, party to get to to actually get down to the pole. I think it's like 200 miles less or something, isn't it? Indeed. From the Bay of Wales. Indeed. Indeed. He's he's uh, 
clearly done a bit of research and figured out that Bay of Wales might be the way to go. Definitely. Although I think he even, I think he even, he, I think he felt that was almost his biggest gamble. Even I read somewhere because I think it was just less tested than where the British started. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I have a feeling that uh, Scott was following in the footsteps of Shackleton and the expedition yes. that had already been there a few years prior to it. And Is that discovery. Yes, or Nimrod, something like this. Nimrod, or Nimrod or Discovery, one of these. Anyway, yeah, it, Scott was on it. Yeah, right? he was on it, and they had to turn back because they realised that they'd never make it. Uh, but undeterred, Scott is now in position for a second attempt. And you'd think that okay, well, they'd landed on their on on Antarctica. Can they just offload their boats with all the equipment they need and and have at it? But there was actually a long preparation window uh, because you had to wait for the perfect weather conditions. Uh, the Antarctic summer was uh, actually in winter. A bit weird, but I suppose everything's upside down. Uh, yeah. Up that end of the pole. And they had a lot of uh, like base camps to set up, which took time, and then little depots. You can't just boldly set off. To the South Pole, you need, of course, to have these depots all along the way with supplies and provisions. And uh, so it's quite a, a massive. It's a much bigger operation, isn't it? Than we get the because we we just know the Scott the, the Scott and his men right at the end. We sort of assume it was just the five of them, but actually to get there, as you say, they've got all sorts of parties laying food depots, trying to plan everything out ration wise. Um, yeah, indeed, indeed, and. As we've mentioned, Scott and his party were also doing loads of experiments for the betterment of science. So they weren't just... Well, that, that's the idea. It yeah. all comes to, yeah, that, to how useful idea. they were to science. Well, <laughs> well we can discuss that uh, if you want. I would argue that they did They did a lot more than Amundsen, who was in it for the sport, really. He was just charging yeah. to the pole. Um, yeah, there was this preparation time, but by the time Amundsen arrived, Scott had already been there. A while, a few weeks, and uh, you know, dicking around with all these science experiments. I don't know, tasting the snow or seeing <laughs> seeing if your piss freezes. I don't know what they were doing exactly. Uh, do you know what they were doing, Phil? That Henry Birdie Bowers, hardy fellow, uh, absolutely Cherry Garrard. We'll call him Cherry for the rest of this uh, story. And old Bill Wilson, who wasn't that old, but you've got to say old Bill Wilson, um, took 35 days to collect three emperor penguins' eggs in July 1911. Um, They were obsessed with finding the eggs of emperor penguins. Emperor penguins, they decided, looked like the most primitive bird and therefore the most likely to be the missing link to lizards and dinos. Um, They were sure about this, and thus it was worth, they thought, the risk of going to get the eggs. Um, There was only one time you could get the eggs, and that was in the cold... Well, cold doesn't even cover it, the, like, pitch-dark, murderous Antarctic winter. To the east, in Cape Crozier. Have you got a question, by the way? I've got a few questions. Like, why? Why did they want the eggs again? I understand that they thought they were the missing link. They were presumably going to dissect the eggs and yes. prove something about the embryos being like weird little lizard bird embryos. Something like that. That was that was their thought. So they want the embryos. And um, how how did they get them? They were like, push the penguin over and just take the egg i mean i don't think penguins are going to put up much of a fight to be honest but no uh, but the, the the terrain on the way to get the penguin eggs did put up a massive fight they had to get them in the darkness of winter so basically they went off on the, on a just an insane expedition where they kept falling down crevices their tent blew away um, yeah. All in the name of science. Because Winston Bowers and a chap called Cherry have a theory and they think that every penguins came straight from lizards. They provide the missing link. You see? I see. <laughs> Excellent. But they'd have to travel miles into ice Antarctic death 
It was dark all day and night, and they might have nothing left. How many of these penguin eggs did they p- 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 pick up? Well, well, we'll get there. We're not yet there. We're not yet at Cape Crozier. We must head for Cape Crozier, where the emperor penguins lay. Priceless eggs and embryos to prove their link with dinos. <laughs> Unfortunately, this theory is, of course, bullshit, right? Well, we don't know that yet. For now, it's all in the name of science. So they persuade Captain Scott to let them go, even though this is an enormously risky venture. Um, it was literally dark all day and night, pitch dark, like it, absolutely horrendous winds. Their tent blew away. They all nearly died many times. But then they finally got there, Johnny. Um, and the eggs, the, the, the emperor penguin rookery was way up on um, way up on an ice shelf. You understand? So, is it called a rookery or? Yeah, I wasn't. Ah, good. What you think? Oh, that might have been just for for rooks. You think I'm just making all of penguins. this up as I go along? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it, to be honest. Like a side quest in a in, a, in an adventure game. Well, yeah, like that... Monkey Island or, uh, or Zelda. That is what it. Get the penguin eggs. <laughs> yeah, um, but they they got there, of course. Uh, looked, observed the penguins, killed and ate some penguins, of course, for their blubber. Um, mm-hmm. I think they took six eggs, or th- five or six eggs, and they dropped a few clambering back down the, like, sheer cliff of the rookery. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, by a complete uh, complete miracle, they got home, but not before they'd... Ac- one of them took out... Nearly took out um, their own site. Cherry took, nearly took out his own site with a bit of uh, boiling over penguin blubber that sparked out of this his little survival meal and, like lashed him in the eye um, to my 21st century eyes it seems that they've got just an unhealthy obsession with these penguins of course now the emperor penguin it's quite a well-known bird and everyone recognizes it it's iconic but presumably back in early 1900s barely anyone had any idea what an emperor penguin was they would have been very unique just because no one was really traveling to the Antarctic or taking pictures of them. And I suppose this is why we've got these weird images uh, from Scott's expedition of them like just messing around with penguins, like tying them yeah. on a rope and on a pole. And there's even some footage from Amundsen's that, that, uh, that shows one of Amundsen's crew sort of dancing with a penguin and almost menacing it with a knife, it oh looks God. like. <laughs> but yeah, it seems like the, the penguins are... A bit hard done by here, getting their eggs stolen, being menaced, being eaten. Definitely. Poor penguins. Poor old penguins. Um, poor old Cherry, though. The three of them limp back with their three eggs to uh, to base camp, um, like all of them near death. Uh, of course, Birdie Bowers and uh, Wilson would go on the final quest to the pole and die with Scott. Cherry didn't go on the quest, but he did go on the quest to recover their... Well, to find out what happened to them. So Cherry was one of the men who found their bodies uh, in the frozen tent, spoiler alert. Um, but I, I say all this because Cherry eventually got the eggs back to London, um, and he went to the Natural History Museum, and they were just like, What? Just eggs, mate? And he like kept going back and just they kept getting rid, like disgruntled people refusing to take the eggs. Um, and one of them said, "What do you think this is, mate? An egg shop? What do you think this is? An egg, some kind of egg they're, shop? They're not Fabergé. No. <laughs> so um, he was just regular penguin. No missing link. No nothing. You just got a handful of eggs. <laughs> Given how hard it was to get them, nobody really cares. And apparently by the by the time he managed to get the embryos analysed, science had already moved on past the point of thinking that emperor penguins were related to um, dinosaurs anyway. So it was all for nothing. But the eggs um, do still attract crowds in the Natural History Museum, not least because of their amazing story. 
I've been to the Natural History Museum relatively recently, last year. Uh, can't remember too many crowds on the egg display floor. They're not bringing in quite as much people as the dinosaurs. But, yeah, fair enough. Next time I'm there, I will, I will seek out these eggs and <laughs> give a knowing nod. Goodness me, I, I had no idea what those penguins were up to. First as a tragedy, then as a farce. Repeats itself. P -p Pick up a penguin. Repeats itself. Lovely. They, they had other animals, though. Mm -hmm. Could you discuss a little bit about the actual animals they took? Oh, to yes. The very, very important. I find important. that quite interesting. Choice of animals. Also it's very, like, very uh, important. Uh, very much like a game where you have to select your method of transport beforehand. And, uh, yeah, think carefully about it because each one has different traits and different skills and might work better in certain conditions. And uh, Amundsen's brought, what, 93 dogs? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Siberian Huskies were the ones for Amazon, uh, Amundsen uh, because he noticed that if you're uh, an Inuit and you're travelling across the vast icy wastelands of uh, Greenland or the Arctic or wherever, they were always using Huskies and they were very hardy dogs and they could pull sledges at pretty good speeds for very long distances. Uh, yeah, the, added the, the British, bonus of... The British saw going. Inuit using this and thought, oh, God, we don't want to do it like Inuits do it. Apparently. Indeed, indeed. Scott actually wrote, in my mind, no journey ever made with dogs can approach the height of that fine conception which is realised when a party of men go forth to face hardships, dangers and difficulties with their own unaided efforts and by days and weeks of hard physical labour succeed in solving some problem of the great unknown. Surely in this case the conquest is more nobly and splendidly won. So yeah, he, he didn't want to use dogs. He wanted to uh, rather use a concept of man-hauling. Uh, which was basically rather than attach your sledges and all the uh, equipment that you require, tents and food and whatnot, uh, to a team of dogs to pull it, uh, you attach it to yourself and pull it by <laughs> man work. Man uh, he did actually also have some, some ponies, Siberian ponies, to help with the really uh, arduous treks, but a lot of them weren't very... Uh, very well accustomed to the climate and perished quite quickly. So, yeah, for, for most of it, Scott and his buddies were man hauling. And our man, Captain Oates, famous uh, Oates, he was in charge of ponies. And in his many slagging offs of the mission, he he reckoned the ponies weren't fit for purpose. They were they were five pound ponies uh, from I think some in India. They got them from, but Oates was very much like these are not the uh, the best kind of ponies for us. Um, Scott did also, though it's not an animal, take a tractor, um, tractor which was which was all could, was known to, as a tin dog. I think Amundsen refers to it as a tin dog. Um, mm -hmm. Problem with the tractors, of course, is uh, they weren't tested properly in cold chambers, so they literally just stopped working. Oh, there's Oates, Captain, dear Captain Oates, with the ponies. Indeed, yes, we got Captain Oates with his ponies there, giving them a little pet again. Sadly, none of these would have survived the trip back. Uh, and Didn't yeah, they, they survived right, they... the trip there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the trip Sorry back. to laugh, pony fans. We'll come to, the, to that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they they also had these these tractors, as you mentioned, uh, these sort of uh, caterpillar tract devices, and. Oh, yeah. They were yeah pretty yeah, pretty fearsome looking machines, but in reality not that great because as you said they required a lot of maintenance. They required a lot of fuel to run, so uh, quite heavy. And I believe the biggest one of them, uh, mm. a little bit bigger than the one we can see in the picture here, it just sunk through the ice when they were unloading it. It was too heavy for the ice flow that they were on. So as soon as they got it off the ship, they sunk it to the bottom of the Antarctic Ocean. 
such treacherous terrain as well. Like the amount of times they all they're just falling into crevices constantly. Dogs. Indeed. Scott's, Indeed. Also, with Scott and the dogs, like he, it, it seems like his his sort of attitude to dogs really kind of makes him fail partly. Like he he sort of doesn't think they'll that they'll work as well as Amundsen, fair enough. But equally, like, he's he's really sentimental about animals and humans. Like, as you... And, you know, he's got this, like, really romantic idea. Like, as you say, oh, well, if you suffer, that makes it a better victory. It's so British. To this day, work hard, not smart. If you're not suffering, you're not doing it right. Yeah. Meanwhile... Yeah, it's a bit crazy. You've got a man who is based on one practical objective. That's what he's going to achieve. This is... Oh, God, here we... I'm getting a bit... Of the fed up of old Scott, but we mustn't be too harsh. Well, it's, it it doesn't end well for all of the dogs uh, because the weaker ones were actually shot and eaten, both by the men and the other dogs. And Scott, yeah, he was a little bit sentimental about the dogs. He saw them as like companions and friends, mm. and he saw it as barbaric to be eating your dogs that have towed you so far. Yeah. Uh, so there was this. Uh, but yeah, was man hauling better? Probably not. I think at the end of the day, if if it was a choice between towing your supplies on a sledge by yourself in this harness or strapping up two dozen dogs, I'd I'd always go for the dogs. You know, yeah. let them do the hard work. They're beasts of burden. And I believe in the early part of the expedition, when these guys see Amundsen going off, they literally just see, like, a kind of Father Christmas figure in a sledge being pulled by dogs that's going so fast. <laughs> I think it went, like... Must, I think that Amundsen went about twice the speed, even. As, oh, as yeah, man. definitely, definitely. Particularly on the way back, uh, Amundsen was flying back. I, I read that he was able to do, like, 70 to 90 kilometres in a day on the return journey when the loads were a little bit lighter and yeah he was cracking the whip with the dogs so to speak and yeah flying home didn't and take him that long at all on the return leg while we're in there talking of our scientists in the british party when they're literally all dying trying to get back from the pole they're still collecting geological samples and increasing their load the load of the thing stuff they're having to drag back but at that point Anyway, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. I was going to say, though, I believe... So, yeah, read the dogs and Scott. I don't think Scott's team ever had any plans to eat the dogs. Whereas Amund- Amundsen, I think, right from the beginning, knew he was basically going to eat all the dogs one by one. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. It was well planned out. It was sort of like the Inuit way of travelling long distances. Uh, if you ran out of food, uh, then you'd eat the dog. Uh, if... One got weak because obviously pulling sledges and men is hard work for the poor hounds. Uh, If it got weak and couldn't pull any more, there was no point letting it go to waste and just leaving it lying around on the ice. You'd eat it and feed it to the other dogs as well. So there was some pretty brutal dog cannibalism going on. Um, Same goes for the the ponies, um, I believe. Scott, Scott didn't want to shoot the ponies, even though Oates was like, shoot the pony and we'll eat the pony according to Wotes, we'll come back to that um, but um, there, there's that, that horrend- horrendous thing that shows that I think they've lost a load of dogs anyway because they kept falling I think there's one a couple of dogs fall into a ravine and literally Scott's party lower Scott into the ravine to rescue the dogs which is nice, it's all nice but is it competent in this mm. really extreme scenario well, uh, no man left got, behind you've got the sentimentality of Scott versus the cold calculation and pragmatism of Amundsen and yeah, yeah in this case uh, cold and calculating is probably better than a bit of warm fuzzy sentimentality for your hound well Amundsen did there is a say, source of theory I made that uh, up but had Scott taken a dog team and had his men been properly trained in driving them, then he, he would have had a much easier time uh, in getting back. I, I really, but just when I look at like the picture of them dragging sledges, it just seems like such hard work. Yeah. And as you were saying earlier, the clothing choice here really came back to haunt them because they were wearing wool and like a uh, sort of impermeable material material that was good and waterproof uh, and was very warm, sure. But also they sweated a lot 
and when you're sweating um, in the Antarctic, it's really not good at all no. if you can't release that sweat. And the wool sort of soaked up the sweat and the impermeable material that they were wearing didn't let it out. Uh, so they're getting very hot and sweaty while hauling these heavy sledges, uh, whereas Amundsen and his lads, they're just dressed in reindeer uh, furs, which are nice and breathable, and they're not sweating half as much because they've, uh, <laughs> they've got the dogs to do the hard work. Exactly. And Scott also has, like, really, compared to Amundsen, has much, much worse luck with the weather. So as you say, like, they get, like, weirdly unseasonably, like, warm bits that make them sweat and then, like minus 60 blizzards suddenly apparently the weather can just change like that from ice flow mm. to, to ice flow um speaking of which the ponies we know what ended up happening to them i mean i've spoiled it earlier but i was reading that account when they they go there they get on an ice flow and they're trying to get the ponies and everyone across and then like a pod of orca come and start doing their kind of uh their behaviour, their hunting behaviours as they would do to a seal on an ice floe which is like 12 of them in unison like splashing, knocking it and these guys who'd never been to Sea Worlds presumably or seen Free Willy um, had to watch this like with very limited knowledge, it must like they were terrified, the way they described them, their evil pig eyes they call them, like well, you know when they rise up and you just see that the eyes focused on the pony on the ice floe um, I think it was um Birdie, Birdie Bowers said that they had a horrible pig eye. Um, and even then, when, even then, bless, I'm mean, bless them because I love animals. I completely understand all this stuff. Um, even then, they're like wasting energy, if you will, on, on sledgehammering the ponies to death so that the, they don't have to be eaten alive by the orca, which is, again, it's very nice about the ponies, but it feels like slightly wasted energy. Um, easy for me to say. Never been. I assume, though, they were sledgehammering <laughs> ponies to death. Uh, not actually on the pole expedition, though, right? This was, like, you know, around base camp. Um, what, the, the orcas? Because you don't get orcas, like, halfway to the pole. Yeah, so, sorry, this is it's, this must have been actually coming on to the ice shelf then, I guess. Mm -hmm. So right sure. at the beginning, that was. Um, the orca bit. Interesting. I'm not sure. Are you sure? Well, yeah, you wouldn't get orcas in, on land, would you? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Um, so, yeah, it must have been, like, getting off the boat and the orcas spied a meal, or, like, on their coastal adventures, maybe, to yeah. catch a penguin. And they, were crossing, they were crossing ice flows at that time. I, I, but I thought it was a bit later, just because they'd, yeah, they, they'd already lost a load of dogs and... I don't know. They had rotten luck all the way, though, for, for sure. Unlike the ninja. Whoosh. So, yeah, for fast forward uh, to the South Pole, December, mm. I believe it was, that Amundsen got there. Uh, yep. December 1911, let's say December 14th or 15th, I believe they were circling in on the South Pole. Uh, took some measurements. For and, there, he went. Yeah, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, a little celebratory meal when they got to the South Pole, high fives all round. Uh, and then, of course, took the journey back and no, no, no real nightmares or hardships for Amundsen at all uh, on the journey there and the journey back. I think once he said he was a little bit disorientated, but then one of their teams spied these flags that they'd laid out at the next depot and said, oh, yeah, we found our way again. So yeah, uh, pr pretty undramatic. Whereas when you contrast that to poor Scott and his team, uh, you know, they're going there with high hopes and high expectations and they are really struggling to pull all these sledges and, you know, they've had some bad luck with the ponies uh, perishing on the way there and they've had, you know, lots of crevices to navigate because of the glacier that they're crossing, the men falling down them and whatnot. But they finally get to near the South Pole, and then what do they see? Damn it. Norwegian flag and a tent. A little and tent. And a letter inside it to Scott saying, yeah, well, we're here first. Take this letter to, uh, to the King of Norway, if you would. What was and his name, the good... King of Norway again? King Harold, maybe? Something like that. It's irrelevant, but it's a funny name. It's, it's, it's a little irrelevant. But, uh, yeah, they, they, they get there and they see 
this devastating uh, signs that they're not the first one. They can see uh, that their effort has been in vain. No one remembers the second team to the poll. Oh, no, except in actually in this case, as they would as, as would soon. <laughs> in this case, um, yeah, I think so... as you were saying about the depots as well, and Amundsen nearly missing that flag. Like I, apparently, according to Ranel Fines, who's like Scott's big d- defender, uh, the the explorer, um, there was like I think Scott Scott's party were meant to use dogs. I think on the, like the last dash, but they like missed the meet up point or the depot where they were supposed to like get those dogs because of mm. the weather and disorientation um yeah man hall man hall it's trying to pick up a little scott of the antarctic clip but there's a there's a very good bit obviously where that shows them like motoring on to the the pole and like seeing the flag and oh it's just awful and then of course all the way back the diaries are like they're not they're so sad they're trying to justify the mission constantly um and of course like they're like buggered half of them already oats's leg uh is very bad on top of a war mm. a war wound on that some years prior mm. um they've all taken terrible injuries and when it came to the point where scott picks his final team which which apparent according to Ranolf, you don't have to do that until the end, um, till you've done all the depot laying, and then you pick the healthiest men. Which Adamson, I think, was really careful about. Whereas Scott's team like lied so they could go um, with devastating com- consequences, of course, because um, I think Evans was first first to die. Who mm, who'd taken yeah, Evans all. suffered a couple of nasty falls and. Yeah. They believe that he was concussed from one of these falls. And, you know, if you're having to pull a sledge in with concussion and frostbite, you're not going to be in any fit state. And, yeah, he, he passed away in a tent, I believe, uh, not too far from the South Pole, somewhere on the Beardmore Glacier. Yeah, let me bring the map up. Oh, the Beardmore Glacier. Not a not a nice place to be, I've heard. Oh, Here he is, so. yeah. Yeah, Evans, he, he sort of made it, you know, halfway back home. Yeah, which is quite no a long further, way. Further, no um, further. And then Oates, of course, very famously, uh, is in a bad way. And the team have literally been carrying him yeah. for the last few steps of his journey, which can't have helped either, like dragging a dead man. He's actually said to them, leave me behind. But they're like, no, no, we'll, we can't leave you behind will carry you. So again, exerting more energy on someone who is unfortunately a lost cause by this point. Exactly. And I should say here, also we think because, of course, so much of the sources for this come from like two people, like Scott's diary and uh, one of the others, I think. It's really hard actually to be completely sure of exactly what happened, I think, because they're so concerned in the diary about reassuring their family um, and reassuring everyone of gallantry. Um, anyway, forget that. Point is, from the South Pole, they are going as fast as their slowest injured person, which is Evans first, of course, and then Oates, and then the remaining three expire, of course. And they're pretty near to it. They're only so, like, what's it, like, seven miles off? Yeah, I think they're 11 miles from their depot that could have possibly saved them. Mm. Um, if they'd have managed to you know, get more food and provisions and been able to rest up for a bit. Um, yeah, of course, when Oates dies, uh, he goes down in history with his very famous phrase and self-sacrifice when he says I'm just stepping outside for a while and I may be gone for some time walks yeah. off into a blizzard and his body is never found no uh, but he, he left his shoes at the tent hmm um, yeah yeah he just sort of more or less stripped off not quite stripped off not full naked but he didn't take his big fur with him fully well knowing that he wanted to to seek death because he was just slowing everyone down he knew that uh, perhaps there was a chance that that Scott and Wilson um, and what's his face Bowers um, could have Bowers. had little could have had a chance uh, if he wasn't with them. 
Uh, yeah. So he was he was prepared to sacrifice himself, and Scott wrote what a noble thing it was, and uh, how he was a brave English gentleman. Uh, and then, yeah, a few miles further on, Scott Wilson and Bowers they get caught in this epic blizzard, yeah, uh, with like unprecedentedly cold for this time of year. They just weren't prepared for that at all and weren't expecting it. Uh, so it's bad luck in part, like maybe a little bit of bad planning. Uh, you could level it at them. Uh, at the British team, bad planning, but yeah, I think really it comes down to bad luck with this weather. Had it not been for the weather, uh, maybe had it not been for Evans stumbling or uh, few. I th- there was also few... a point I think where Wilson and Bowers actually were planning apparently to like basically bugger off. I think when they're walking with Oates, or so they say, should we go ahead at least to the next depot and sort things out? But the idea of them all staying together is sort of a, a little bit lethal, although, you know, I suppose it's nice in a way. Um, also, uh, the famous quote of Oates going out of the tent, strangely, like, that's, uh, that's only recorded in Scott's diary, but neither of the other guys who are writing about it, interestingly. Um, yeah. It was very dark. I think they were in that tent for eight days without when they'd run out of food and fuel in the dark and cold before they died, they reckon. Mm. Yeah, it would be not a nice way to go. Certainly a fairly hopeless feeling. But respect to them, they all had a morphine uh, supply that they could have taken to end it quickly, but none of them did because... Well, reasons. <laughs> I don't know why, but God, uh, they they didn't want to end it quickly. They they sat it out, maybe hoping that someone would find them. Maybe uh, like they're quite religious, so probably suicide was not seen as an honourable or godly thing to do. Unless you do it by walking out of a tent, in which case uh, it becomes a gallant act <laughs> for the ages. There we go, then. There we go. <laughs> Who knows almost what happened there? I think, uh, in fact, I've got a little fun fact. Well, not even a fact. It's from an episode of Red Dwarf from 1991. Um, and uh, basically, Rimmer says... Captain Oates was a prat. If that had been me, I'd have stayed in the tent, whacked Scott over the head with a frozen husky, and then eaten him. He then adds, How do we know that Oates went for this legendary walk from the only surviving document, Scott's diary? And he's hardly likely to have written down February the 1st, bludgeoned Oates to death while he slept, then scoffed him along with the last packet of instant mash. How's that going to look when he gets rescued, eh? No, much better to say, Oates made the supreme sacrifice while you're dabbing up his gravy with the last piece of crusty bread. <laughs> Alternative view there, definitely. <laughs> A little comedic view. A little comedic view. And um, I might just give you a little little question quiz here, Johnny. Which 20th century literary figure was named after one of the big polar explorers, please? Hello? Uh, there we go. Scott. F. Fitzgerald? <laughs> no. I'll give you a clue. He was a bit of a twit <laughs> when it came to a anti-Semitism. Ah, OK. Roald Dahl. Yeah, named after Roald Amundsen, apparently. I see. OK. I think Roald was also quite a popular name, though, at the time. But probably mm. Amundsen popularised it even more. Yeah. <laughs> because he was uh, quite, quite a celebrity in Norway. Uh, of course, not a celebrity everywhere. His his reputation was somewhat tarnished by what actually happened to Scott. Um, had Scott made it back alive, he probably would have been a much bigger celebrity. Amundsen would have been a much bigger celebrity. But the death of Scott, particularly by the British press, was, you know, finger was pointed a little bit in Amundsen's direction for making it a race, for putting pressure on, uh, perhaps unfairly. Perhaps fairly, I don't know. Up to you to decide, dear listener, uh, whether Amundsen put the pressure on Scott and made him make some bad decisions or whether it was just bad luck. Uh, but, yeah, the upshot was that, particularly by the British, Amundsen was seen as a villain in this story, whereas Scott uh, was seen as more like the heroic adventurer risking it all for king and country. Yeah. Not quite gaining the glory, but certainly uh, gaining... The legacy. Did you yeah, know actually that, uh, that Roald Amundsen um, briefly fact, 
toyed with the idea of bringing polar bears <laughs> to <laughs> to the uh, to the Arctic, uh, to the Antarctic, and uh, he was actually experimenting in 1908 and 1909. He enlisted a German an- animal tamer called Karl Hagenbeck to train these polar bears to pull his sledges. <laughs> like obviously, polar bear is a terrible idea, being the most vicious and largest land predator <laughs> in the world. Uh, but Amundsen is like, for a normally pragmatic and shrewd guy, this just crossed his mind. Uh, and Hagenbeck was so egging him that... on, telling him that, yeah, it's possible, you know, you can you can even let them sleep in your tent at night so that you can lie next to them and they'll be soft and warm. Blimey. He's not my favourite, actually. I do have a favourite. Well, let's sign that. Then Johnny's favourite things. My favourite explorer of cold weather lands is a Danish explorer called Peter Freuken. And... Yeah, to me, he is just like an absolute total legend because he's he's such a character. He he first got interested in exploring uh, the Arctic areas because he didn't like medical school, and he thought, "How can I have an adventure? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just get on a ship and go to Greenland with my loose mate." He was a six foot seven giant of a man, big beard, long hair. And he became immediately enamoured with Greenland. Uh, like, no small feat. His, his greatest uh, exploration feat was actually to traverse Greenland with a dog sled with his buddy Knut. Years in Greenland, uh, married an Inuit lady, and he even founded a town there called Tool, <laughs> uh, which is like a trading post. So he's just like out there trading, exploring, fathering children, uh, living life as a native uh, and one day he gets caught in a blizzard this is this is where he makes his name for himself he gets caught in a blizzard well out with his dog sled and uh, realises that there's no way out so he sort of turns his sledge upside down uh, snow covers him and luckily he's wearing his nice woolen, not woolen, sorry, fur clothing because he's gone full native for Luinia. So it's nice and warm, uh, but he's buried in snow, sort of hunched by this dog sled. Uh, and it's covered him, he can't get out, he's trying to punch his way out and claw his way out. Nothing doing. So he's very resourceful. He he shits himself and <laughs> and fashions his poo into like a little chisel shape it freezes and he's able to chisel his way out <laughs> with his little poo dagger he says I moved my bowels and from the excrement I managed to fashion a chisel like instrument which I left to freeze at last I decided to try my chisel and it worked Climbing. So, yeah, he's chiselled his way out with his own poo. Uh, He he looks around, he sees one of his dogs is still alive, miraculously. The other one is frozen and is dead. He butchers the dog, uh, repairs his sledge, which was also broken, uh, as he sort of used it as his lean-to. One of the runners was broken, so he uses the butcher's dog (laughs) ribcage to... To pre- repair the sledge runner and sort of just half pulled, half crawling back to his camp uh, <laughs> with his little poo up. dagger. I don't know if he butchered the dog even with his poo <laughs> dagger. Probably. Probably. Uh, the upshot of all this is he's got horrible frostbite on one of his toes and he amputates them personally himself with a pair of pliers. Uh, like, he then goes... <laughs> <laughs> a few years later, he has to have this foot removed completely uh, because gangrene is set in and, and he has a peg leg replaced. Um, like Amazing story of survival. Uh, but this is not the, even the, le- the least of his adventures. He's, uh, he's involved in the Danish underground uh, against the Nazis. He's actually a Jew um, and... 
uh, whenever anyone is talking about anti-Semitism in Denmark at the time, in the uh, late 30s, if he hears it, he'll stand up to his full height and say to the... Uh, to the offender, I am a Jew, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and, uh, he was a, a perpetual thorn in the Nazi side when they did take over Denmark. He was uh, hiding Jews and helping them escape, and yeah, just generally uh, contributing to the resistance. So he's locked up by the Nazis, but that's not going to keep him if uh, he can escape from an avalanche, basically buried up to, up to his neck in snow so to speak the Nazis can't hold him he escapes he makes his way to America um, where he uh, uses his fortune from a previous marriage he married uh, the heiress to a Danish butter empire mm. uh, no, <laughs> I don't think it was Lerpak, one, one similar, Lerpak competitor. Uh, but he's, he's quite wealthy from that, uh, but in the end he gets divorced from this lady uh, after his yeah, first Inuit wife has died. Um, actually, the church said that they wouldn't bury his Inuit wife, so he dug a grave himself in the church and buried her. And again, just uses his imposing physical strategy. Like, what are you going to do about it? Did he use it? the shit to dig the grave? <laughs> <laughs> made a shit shovel. Th- this guy is great. Yeah, he writes uh, thirty novels. He stars in his own uh, his own movie uh, called Eskimo. Uh, but it was quite a big hit, actually. Uh, Eskimo. Uh, Hitler's favourite director, Lenny Riefenstahl, went to see it, and. Uh, as we said, Peter, he didn't really like Nazis very much. He was aware that she was a Nazi, and he spent most of the premiere sort of chasing her and picking her up and twirling her around his head and just laughing manically uh, through oh, his own premiere. It just gets better and better. I wasn't expecting him to pick up Lenny Reef to run around with her. <laughs> Time to finish. Oh, here we are, Johnny, back in the garage. A little chilly. Nice, nice to have some heating, isn't it? Proper central heating. I mean, if that's what you call it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if there's any radiators. Beef and igloo. <laughs> Beef and igloo on the on the Ross ice shelf. That is very true. Um, the big question is, what item have you brought back from our travels? Put back a penguin egg, but unfortunately, it got cracked. Oh. Okay. So it's just like a yokey mess. Whew, big pocket, I imagine. Big pocket. All I can think about is the frozen poo, which we didn't go there, so I can't bring that back. Can I? <laughs> no, oh. It was some years later, anyway, that he escaped his uh, icy tomb with his poo. That's true, but it was mentioned. It was mentioned, yeah, I guess you can have it then. Mm. Just don't let it fall out in my garage. <laughs> no, I'm going to go for a nice Amundsen fur uh, set-up to sleep in here. Ooh, lovely, yeah, toasty. <laughs> oh, night, Johnny. Good night, Phil. Sleep warm and cosy. Thank you.